Hi, everybody. Can you all hear me? Yes. Great. Uh, so hi, my name is Ethan Rosenthal. I am a data scientist at Dia & Co uh, here in New York. Uh, you can find me on Twitter and GitHub, and I have a data blog that I don't update often enough. Um, so today I'm going to tell you a story about uh, kind of our, our journey into doing deep learning at Dia & Co. Uh, so I'm going to start with all the th things that we tried to do to avoid doing this, uh, and then I'll talk about how we ended up having to go down this route. Uh, but before that, I'd like to explain what my company does and why it exists. So uh, I'm going to start off with a stat for the data people in the room. So nearly 70% of women in the US are plus size, but they only represent 16% of apparel spend. Uh, and so what you see is that we have a majority of the US uh, is representing a minority of the spend. And you know, some people think that this is maybe due to lack of interest in fashion by this segment. Uh, but kind of the thesis of Dia & Co is that this is a lack of opportunity to participate in fashion. Um, and so that's where we come in, is uh, to help that opportunity. So Dia & Co is the leading digital first retailer dedicated to serving women, sizes 14 and up. Um, and we do this through a particular business model. So the way our service works, uh, is you sign up on our website, fill out some information about yourself. So you tell us uh, what sorts of clothing you like, uh, your size, your height, and other sorts of uh, relevant things in order for us to get you clothing that you will like. Uh, so the way that we do that is we have a stylist pick out uh, five items of clothing that she thinks that you will like. Uh, these then get sent to you uh, in a box. Whatever you like, you keep and pay for. Whatever you don't like, you send back to us. And you tell us why you didn't like it, and that helps us to get better at making sure that each time you're getting more and more of what you like. Um, and so you can kind of think of our stylus in some sense as like the ultimate recommendation system. Um, so, you know, what is the ultimate recommendation system? It's somebody that it's like your friend who knows you really well who's saying, hey, like, I think you're going to love this. Uh, and so, I think of things in terms of recommendation systems. I like I've done a fair amount of these, and so we can think of this like a user-to-item recommendation. So, given the user, which is our customer, uh, what sorts of items might she like? Uh, and we see recommendation systems everywhere. We can t look at you know the big tech companies of the day, and they all have recommendation systems on their platform. So, Spotify uh, will recommend certain albums to you based on what you've listened to given uh, recent shopping interests that you might have had on Amazon, they will know that you're building a deep learning computer. Uh, and Netflix will you know, sort these items uh, according to what they think that you like. Uh, and so from my side, where do I come in in this? Uh, I work on the styling algorithms team. Uh, and it's my goal to bring power to the stylus. And so, you know, I can ingest all of this data. I can try to build out fancy recommendation systems. But uh, that's not necessarily going to help the stylus if they don't really understand why the algorithm thinks that these items are important. Um, and so kind of our goal is to, to bring the power of all of that data, all of the fancy algorithms, uh, and, and bring it to the stylus. And so one common way that you might see this done is on these exact same platforms. So if you look on Spotify, given a certain band that you might have listened to, it will recommend other bands. And it is telling you that it is recommending this uh, and providing context around why uh, these bands are being recommended. Amazon does the same thing, uh, and Netflix as well. And so providing this context is really helpful for understanding why items are being recommended uh, and then allowing the end user to evaluate that. Um, and so we can think of this as an item to item recommendation. Uh, so before we had user to item, this is item to item in the sense that given this item, uh, here are other similar items to that, and then we can provide context. Uh, but you could argue that similarity is subjective, and it is. Um, however, you know, I was tasked with this this project at work, and I was like, no, 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 like, like I got this because we see classic item to item recommendations all the time. Uh, Amazon tells you how they do it. They say customers who bought this item also bought that other item, and so they are telling you, you know, this is the data that they're using, and this is how they're building the recommendation. And so when I was tasked with this, I was like, all right, I got this. Like, I have this trick up my sleeve matrix factorization. I've used it a whole bunch of times. Like, we're gonna be good to go. 
uh, and I was wrong. However, before we get to that, uh, so what did I do? I said, all right, I've used matrix factorization before, recommendation systems, and everything else. Uh, let me go grab this library implicit, uh, which is open source. It's on GitHub. It's written in Python. Uh, it's actually easy to install, which is usually the hardest part about using libraries. It's super fast because it's written in Cython. It's uh, you know run in parallel and everything else. And it uses this industry standard algorithm for uh, building out recommendations for implicit feedback. Uh, and so I, you know, put in all the data, I trained the model, I got good, you know, loss and everything else, and I was feeling good, but I ran into this issue, and the issue was around temporal separation, and I'll explain what these pictures mean in a second. So, classically, when we think of recommendation systems, oftentimes the items uh, live on for a long time in our system. So, for example, we still read books that were written 100 years ago, um, however, in fashion, we have a bit of a different situation in the sense that our clothing has kind of a, a short half-life, if you will. Um, and so we know that you know, fashion runs on trends and everything else like that. And so what happened was when I trained this algorithm was it would find that old clothes were similar to old clothes. Um, and so as an example, Jerry Seinfeld existed at the same point in time as the Fresh Prince. Um, However, I would argue that their styles are nothing similar. Um, but what my algorithm found was that because you know, these, this clothing existed at the same point in time, it was similar. And so the, these are bad recommendations. Um, and, but this is what we would want, right? We would want to know <clears throat> that Jerry Seinfeld from 15 or 20 years ago has a similar fashion to this Normcore Everlay model. Um, and so that's what we would like. Uh, so I said, all right, fine. You know, this didn't work. Like, I have other tricks on my sleeve. Uh, I'm going to use metadata about the products to kind of connect the past to the future. Uh, so for example, you can imagine in our database that we have information about this clothing. So maybe I know that uh, the sneakers are, that where they're wearing sneakers, they're white sneakers, they're wearing relaxed fit pants and everything else like that. And so maybe with this kind of external information, I could connect uh, clothing from the past to clothing from the future. Uh, so how do we do that? Again, turn to open source software. Uh, there's this library called LightFM, uh, which is excellent as well. It's Python, easy to install, super fast, written in Cython. Uh, you know, it, it works in parallel and everything else. And the nice thing about it is it allows you to incorporate user and product metadata in your matrix factorization recommendations. And so I'd used this before, so I was like, all right, cool, I'll throw this at it and everything will be fine. Uh, but what I found was that if you, you know, send garbage through a black box, then you get garbage out. Um, and I'll explain that in a second. So, you know, we didn't get good results with that. So I said, all right, maybe we won't just look at what people bought. We, we'll look at what we sent them because we have denser data around that. And maybe we can learn more that way. Maybe we can use user metadata in addition to the product metadata. I tried a whole bunch of combinations and nothing seemed to work. And I came to this conclusion that generating high quality metadata is hard. Um, and I kind of started to get philosophical about this and wondered, like, like what is metadata, um, and like, why am I struggling with this problem? And so, if we if we think about metadata a bit, it's what we're doing is we're taking humans and asking them to try to guess what they think uh, is the relevant information about some piece of data. Uh, guess what they think a machine would think was relevant, and so. We're trying to kind of encode this human knowledge, but we're doing it by hand, and it's fairly manual. Um, so there's a lot of room for error, and you know things can get lost in translation. But then also, you know, maybe humans just aren't good at guessing at what a machine would think is relevant. I don't know. Um, but then, you know, I took a step back, and I was thinking about our clothing at work. Uh, you know, and we can look at these different shirts, and arguably they might have different metadata in our system associated with them. For example, you can see that they might have different necklines, they might have different sleeve lengths, uh, possibly silhouettes, and things like that. And so, from the product standpoint, one, you know, from the metadata standpoint, one could argue that these are these are different items of clothing. But at the same time, I feel like we can all just look at it and see that they're fairly similar. Um, and so then it was like, oh, we can look at it and we can see like what else sees, and that's where 
uh, we started to get into deep learning. Um, and so I don't want to claim that you know I did this alone. Uh, there's actually two excellent talks out there. One of them is a PyData talk uh, from other fashion companies that have kind of gone down this route. Uh, and started to incorporate computer vision algorithms into their systems. Uh, so one is from these great guys at List who also wrote the LightFM package. Uh, and then there's also a great talk from Thread Genius uh, from the New York City Machine Learning Meetup. List used the algorithm that I'll talk about for finding duplicate items. Uh, Thread Genius was using this for given an image, can I match the clothing in that image to a database of clothing? Um, and we use this for something slightly different. So let me explain how this algorithm works. Uh, but to start with, let's let's think about uh, what was the goal of this algorithm. So uh, there's this paper from 2015 uh, about facial recognition, and you wouldn't think that this was relevant to product similarities, but I'll, I'll get into it. So the the paper, the, the goal of the paper was threefold. So one was they wanted to be able to verify faces. So given this face is this other picture a picture of the same person? Uh, here, obviously, the answer is no. Um, the goal was also to look at uh, facial recognition. So given this face, uh, which person might we match to that face? Um, and then lastly was around clustering. So can I find clusters of faces that tend to look similar? And Google actually provided me with this, which was, which was great. I was able to, to search, and other people have found this. Uh, and so it was this last goal of the paper that seemed relevant to, to products. So what I would like to be able to do is take images of different products and know that they are roughly similar to each other, such that I could then cluster them, find most similar items, et cetera. And so can we take this face net algorithm and use it for something like product net? So the way the algorithm works is a bit different than kind of what I, at least I was used to. So I'm kind of used to the paradigm of uh, like scikit-learn. You have some design matrix X, you shove it through a model, and then you get some output Y, and, and you can train this in a supervised fashion. Uh, but here, we actually have to do something a little bit different, uh, but, it's, but it's pretty fun. So the way this algorithm works is you start with an image of your product. We'll call this an anchor image. Uh, you can send this through some pre-trained neural network. And then you know that neural network, it's going to learn features of your images and everything else. And it's going to pick out edges and patterns and such. And then at the very end, we're going to output a, a vector. Uh, and so the idea is that this vector kind of is a compressed representation of the image of our product. Uh, we will then take another image of the exact same product. Um, so this will be a positive example. Uh, we send that image through the same neural network and get out a vector. And so we know that the anchor and the positive, we know that these are the same product. Uh, we then take a negative example. So we grab an image of a product that we know is different, send it through the same neural network, and output a vector. Um, and all the algorithm tries to do once we've done this is we would like to move the image of the same product close to that image of the same product uh, in this vector space. And we would like to move the image of the other product away. Uh, and so basically, we're just, you know, we're trying to learn these vectors such that images of the same product end up close to each other and images of different products end up far from each other. Um, and so what this call, what this is, is this is like a triplet sampling technique. Uh, you have these triplet loss functions, which can help you to do this. But uh, without math, we can, what we're basically trying to do is we're trying to minimize the distance between the vectors representing images of the same product and maximize the distance between the vectors representing images of different products. So I read through this whole paper. I was like, all right, let's try to do this. And so how do we end up programming up this algorithm? Uh, I had some requirements. One is I was totally new to this whole area, so I wanted something that was easy to debug because I was going to make mistakes. Um, we're also kind of doing this weird way of, uh, of building up our training data, and so we need some easy way to, to sample. Um, due to some details, which if you're interested, we can talk about later, uh, like there's details of the sampling algorithm such that you actually have to make some dynamic decisions during sampling, like while training. Um, and then lastly, I would like some pre-trained models. So the original paper for this was written by Google. They're using many orders of magnitude more data than we have at our tiny company. And so I don't want to have to train things from scratch. 
So for this, I chose to use PyTorch um, because it seemed to check off all of these boxes. Uh, so first of all, PyTorch ends up being super easy to debug. So uh, just to kind of orient yourselves, at the top, we define a model, which in this case is a linear layer, which is literally just a single number. Uh, this is just a toy, toy example. Um, we can define some data, and we can define like uh, a target for that data. And then we can pass our data through the model and generate a prediction. Um, and what you see is we can kind of just like write down our loss function by hand if we want. Um, we run a backwards pass uh, to basically calculate the gradients. And then what we can do after this is we can actually go through and print out the gradients of our parameters. And so I can do this all in IPython. I can kind of like investigate what's going along, on along the way. Um, and it makes life pretty easy. It, it kind of feels like writing NumPy. The other nice thing is that there are these kind of adjacent packages, which are part of this PyTorch ecosystem, that uh, basically abstract away lots of things. So for example, if you know I'm dealing with images, and so I'm loading them off of the disk, I have to transform their size. Uh, I might want to normalize them and other sorts of things. And through Torch Vision, you can actually just kind of compose these transformations, and they've already taken care of this for you. Uh, loading images off of a disk, they actually have a, a nice class for doing this for you. Um, and then since we're loading multiple images, we're, we're training and everything else, maybe we want to do this efficiently, so we want to do this in, uh, in parallel. And so you can use their data loaders for doing that. Um, if you want to be fancy about your sampling, you can just uh, write a subclass of the, of the uh, data sets, and then it, it makes it pretty easy to do that as well. Um, the other cool thing about PyTorch is you can make these dy dynamic decisions. So let's say I was feeling weird and I wanted to define two models. And every time I shove my data through the model, I then, or like every time I, I sample some data, I flip a coin and I say, if it's heads, I'm going to use this model. If it's tails, I'm going to use that model. I don't know why you'd ever want to do this. But uh, the nice thing here is that I can just write this like Python and, and do this uh, should I want to. Um, and then lastly, for pre-trained models, uh, these, these come pre-packaged. So I can just import ResNet, which is the uh, neural network that I ended up using for my project. Uh, you can import this. You can import it with all of the weights that have been trained on ImageNet. Um, and then what we're actually doing is we're fine-tuning the model. So what that means is that we, when we learn these vectors that I was talking about, we're not actually changing the core neural network. We're only changing that last layer. Uh, we're only learning that last layer where we want to learn the vector representation. And so uh, doing this ends up being, being pretty easy to do uh, with these pre-trained networks. So I read the paper. I like learned enough PyTorch in order to program this up. Uh, and invariably, you're going to end up having bugs in your code and everything else. And so I actually took a page from uh, List's book. They, they mentioned this in their talk, where they talk about trying to overfit. And you know I think. You like if you can't overfit on a very simple scenario, then there's probably something wrong with your code. Uh, and so, what is the simplest scenario that we can imagine? Let's take two products uh, and let's learn a vector for them that is only two elements long. So we can think of this as two dimensions, where maybe the first element of that vector is the x dimension, the second element is the y direction. And what this allows us to do is it allows us to visualize what's going on as we're learning. Um, you can imagine if we had a three element vector, we could visualize this in 3D. And then if you had a four element, you, you can't visualize that. So let's go with something simple. So what we're seeing here is I took multiple images of two products. And this is each epic in training. And we are visualizing what's happening for just learning these two dimensions. And we see that we're nicely able to get them to separate, uh, which was the goal of our algorithm. So it's like, all right, cool. Um, the other fun thing that we can do is we can actually, so what is often done with these algorithms is they normalize that vector at the end. And what this allows you to do is uh, basically it makes your Euclidean distances fairly proportional to your cosine distances. And people often like to use cosine similarity. And so what happens if you normalize a vector in two dimensions? You're actually just confining these guys to live on a ring. Um, if we normalized in three dimensions, we would be confining them to live in, on a, a surface. Uh, and so it's cool. We, we can do this. We can visualize it. We can see that this is still working. Um, next step, all right, we can overfit. Let's stop overfitting, and let's validate on test data. Uh, so one of the things that you can do is you can actually turn this into like a giant multi-class classification problem. 
Um, so imagine I take this image at the center and I kind of look a certain distance from that image in this vector space. And I say that everything that's within that distance, is, I'm going to say, is an image of something that belongs to the same product. And everything outside of that distance is from a different product. Uh, we have now turned this into kind of a binary classification problem. Um, and then you can basically plot ROC curves to see how you're doing. And what's cool is that these algorithms are like super good. And so you end up plotting your ROC curves on a log scale and, and feeling very good about yourself compared to conventional classification problems. So cool, we can validate and everything else. What's next? Uh, you know, our loss functions have come down. We're feeling great. Um, I'd argue that you're not quite ready uh, because the beauty of recommendations is that we can actually ex explore them and look at them to see if they just make some sense. Um, and so what I did is I'll show you. I built this little flask app. Um, and all the flask app does is you click on an image of a product and it shows you what are the most similar products based on their distance in this vector space and what are the least similar products. Um, and you know you can scroll over, you can see what the similarity scores were. And I would argue you know that these other products look fairly similar to that. And so it's like a nice sanity check to make sure that everything is making sense. And what's fun is that you can then go through and explore. And so you can click on one of the products and you can see that one's recommendations and everything else. And so it's kind of, it's, I would argue that it's fun. Uh, it's fun to like travel through here and then also to just, you know, do this for sanity checks. It's harder to do this with just like a conventional logistic regression like classification problem or something like that. Um, so actually, uh, you know, that code is proprietary, but I, I did this for a side project, uh, a very similar idea of visualizing these recommendations. So if you're interested, you can go to this link in the center. Um, and then I also have the code for this up on GitHub. So fine, we, we, we've done all of this. Let's finally build this thing. Um, and so, you know, Everything I've talked about so far has taken up the majority of the talk, but what's funny is that this is the part that ended up taking the majority of the time when I actually did this. Um, and so I just wanted to share two pieces of, uh, I guess, advice or whatever, uh, of things that I learned along the way. Uh, so one of them is that I mentioned that we're fine tuning these models. And so this is an image of, of the neural network that we're learning. Uh, and everything in this, in this square, the, the big bold square, all of that uh, doesn't change every time we uh, like iterate through our data and, and learn our weights um, because we're just freezing that and we're only fine tuning that last layer, which is on the very right. Uh, but it turns out that everything in that box, that takes a really long time to compute compared to that last layer. And so one nice way to speed things up is you just cache the results of everything that's in that box. And when you're actually going through training each epic, you just learn that, that final layer. Uh, and that, that saved me a whole bunch of time after I realized to do this. Um, the other area was around tests. Um, so one is to just use real data when you're making your tests. Uh, there was a time when I uh, tried to just kind of make up fake matrices to represent the images and things like that. Uh, and you just end up kind of writing brittle tests and tying yourself into knots uh, in order to do that. Um, something else was to, to not mock the I.O. So uh, you know, we're, I'm arranging images into different folders on the disk, and I have to sample from these images. And if I want to split up into training and test sets, I have to move images to different folders. Uh, and so I started by mocking all of this in my tests. Uh, and that wasn't good either. Uh, that was like a major pain. Um, and so you know, just using actual images, like committing them to GitHub and using these test images, you know, a couple test Im images and actually, uh, you know, testing, moving things around in, in your directories uh, is, is quite nice. Uh, the other thing is that uh, regression tests can help. So the, these deep learning, uh, like training deep learning models, you know, we have, we have to sample, we have to learn things, we have to write out outputs and things like that. And so having kind of these end-to-end -end tests and, and making sure that they still behave as we, cha as we change the code uh, can be quite helpful. But really, it's it's super hard. Uh, so there's like I, I see blog posts all the time about people, you know, trying to talk about how to how to test machine learning models, and I think it's like definitely still an open area of investigation. Uh, so once everything was tested, it was time to finally uh, you know serialize the results so that other people could use this. Um, and so we tried to take a very simple approach. Uh, basically, we could take all the images for the same product. 
send them through this, this neural network uh, that we learned um, and get their output vectors. And then, you know, simplest way to represent a product in this vector space is we just average all of their images together. Uh, PyTorch has a nice uh, .numpy method, which just transforms your torch tensors into NumPy, tensor, uh, NumPy arrays. And then we just write this to S3. Um, and so that was nice and quick. And then once everything was written, it was time to deploy. Um, so for those of you who care about stacks, uh, we deploy everything on Docker. Um, we use AWS Batch for training our, our models, uh, you know, nightly training and things like that. Uh, everything is integrated with Circle for uh, you know, continuous integration. And then we serve up the uh, similarities and the recommendations uh, via a SANIC API. Uh, which is like a, an asynchronous Python API. Um, and so just wanted to close with this great image that I found. Uh, basically, we tried out a whole bunch of things. Uh, a lot of them didn't work. Uh, and so kind of as a last resort, we ended up going down the deep learning route, uh, which has been quite fun. Uh, like th these frameworks are very powerful and everything else. Uh, but just like with anything, it's important to keep in mind there's there's nothing special about this, uh, and that you know, yeah, just beware. Uh, and that's it. Thank you. Yeah, it's interesting. I, I think that sometimes works better with like classic recommendation systems. The problem here is that, we're, oh, sorry, the, uh, the question was if we've looked at analogies uh, and kind of like outfit pairings to see if uh, a belt goes with a pair of jeans or something like that. Uh, I guess the problem is that this algorithm is solely optimizing for the, the visual representation. And, and the belts will never look anything like the jeans, probably. Uh, and so it's going to be hard for it to learn that, um, at least in the way that we've set things up here. Yeah, so, so the question was around, uh, you know, in some ways, like, should we even be re recommending uh, visually similar items if a customer has already bought something like that? Uh, do they need another flowery top? Uh, and I think we have both types of customers. So we have some customers who find something that they like, uh, and they really want more of it. Um, and then we have other customers who, who explicitly tell us, don't send me any more of that. Uh, and so we're, we're trying, to, trying to satisfy both. That's a good question. Uh, so the question was around, I guess, dissimilar items. So uh, when we looked at similar, uh, most dissimilar to the original top, we saw black items. But then when we uh, reversed it, we didn't necessarily see the others. Um, I'm actually not sure why that ends up happening. One thing I can comment on is kind of the hierarchy that we've just empirically observed, that color seems to be the most important uh, like aspect for similarity. And then it seems like kind of pattern of the clothing is next. And then silhouette seems to pop out as the as the third level in the hierarchy. Uh, but yeah, I, not not exactly sure. Uh, let me, I'll, here. I have a question about your database. Uh -huh. How many clothing items are there? I guess it's a lot, because you had like six shirts. Yeah. Probably can't say exactly how many items there are. Uh, lots of them are not in stock anymore, uh, but definitely we have. Let's say let's say thousands, not millions. Yeah. No. So actually, uh, that is the nice aspect of this is that we're not dealing with scaling issues like that. Uh, so for example, you know, there's like approximate nearest neighbor methods for finding most similar items. Uh, and we actually, we don't have to deal with that because our data is smaller. So we actually just load the whole matrix in memory in the API and then compute the like similarities on the fly. Uh, and it's fine, which is, it's nice while it lasts. Yeah. Or is it their past purchases? 
So we, we try to shove everything we can into it uh, in the sense that, so customers fill out a profile with us uh, so we can turn what they've said into features. Um, we have all sorts of information about our products. Uh, and then we know exactly what our stylists have sent to customers, and then we know what they've purchased, and we also know how they've rated everything. And so we have, we have lots, lots to work off of. Do customers ever send in like, photos of themselves with like, either the outfits I like? So you yep. Have, like, you can figure out which style. Yeah, so, so customers do send in, they send in their photos, uh, they, they show us their Pinterest boards, uh, we have, they, they give us a lot of text feedback. Uh, and so lots of features to build, which tends to take the majority of the time. Yeah. Uh, what was the curating process of like the positive versus the negative examples? Like, have examples there of like a rotated shirt? I imagine that that was a post, for example. Yeah, so the, it's kind of interesting how you build up these positive and negative examples. So the way, the, the way that it's programmed up is, uh, we know what, well, we know the positive examples, and then we kind of have to sample a negative example. Uh, you know, so we know what images are images of the same products, and then we need to pick some image of a different product. Uh, and so actually the way that this works is it's called a hard negative sampling. So what you do is you pick an image uh, that is most similar uh, to your anchor image. And so this is kind of like the hardest one, like the one that's closest to it that we're really trying to push away. And so uh, you end up, sampling from these hard negatives on the fly as you're, as you're training and building up your batches uh, to train. With two products, um, they're the same colors, like would those register to products? And if so, how Yeah, so thankfully we have this all in our database uh, that everything is kind of cataloged into a hierarchy. So we know, we know that like, these are two images of the same product that happen to come in different colors. Uh, and so what we can do, I mean, you know, we train off of this, but then also we can choose to, to filter items uh, for the front end, uh, like in order to do that, so. Yeah. Yeah, so that, that's a great question uh, because as, as I said, so the question was around uh, using grayscale images instead of color. And I mentioned that color was kind of at the top of the hierarchy for similarity. Um, and so that is something that we would like to do because then we could kind of uh, tease out silhouette and pattern and things like that. Uh, the only issue, I guess, well, one is that I haven't had time to do it, but the second one is that a lot of these pre-trained neural networks uh, have been pre-trained based on three colors. Um, and so we would kind of have to go in and modify them and things like that. And so, but it's, yeah, great point. Yeah. How do your humans needs feel about the machines that are telling them what to do, useless, helpful, threatening? <laughs> Good question. How do the humans feel about the machines? Uh, <laughs> yeah, so I think, like, we don't, we don't tell them what to do, um, you know, the, like, I feel good about the algorithms that I've written, but I don't feel good enough uh, that I can interpret everything that a, that a customer is telling us uh, so as a human can. And so like, that is really why, you know, the goal of this isn't to, let's say, limit what they're seeing or anything else. It's really to just tell them, this is why the machine thinks this might be relevant, and then use your human judgment. And then ideally, once they've used their human judgment, we can then feed that back in to then better uh, optimize our recommendations. And so we, we try to, you know, keep things copacetic and everything else. Your stylists are okay with this then? Yeah, yeah, yeah. They're, they're excited about it because they want to know, like, they, like right now they would have to manually search through uh, to find out other similar products, uh, and this can help to save them time and, you know, help them, so. Yeah. Uh huh. Yeah. So are those artist seekers just looking at saying that images that are actually of the same clothing item are said to be of the same clothing item versus images of different clothing items? Or do those curves get at basically that items that should look similar actually are close? 
Yeah, so the question is about the RSC curves and if we're if we're kind of optimizing for items that should look similar or are we uh, just looking like looking for items that truly are the exact same item or images that are truly of the exact same item. And it's the latter because the the original way the algorithm was written was really for facial recognition. Um, and so like if you ever like go into your if anybody uses Google Photos, you can click the search bar and it'll actually show you that they've already grouped you and all of your friends' images together in their database. Uh, or Facebook, right? They they suggest uh, who to tag in this image. And so that's really the goal is being perfect. Uh, for us, like that's not what we're optimizing for, uh, because we want to find other similar items. But the nice thing is that if we if we optimize this algorithm, we kind of get out those similarities for free. Yeah, so the question was around, I guess, the fact that we're using other vendors who have, uh, who have trained on larger data sets. Uh, and I guess there, there's a question around, should we, should we be using that? Maybe we do things ourselves. Uh, or there's, I guess, you could go all the way to like, the, the APIs that these services provide uh, to really not have to do anything on your side. Uh, this feels like kind of a nice middle ground between all of that. Um, I guess you know, it's true that we don't we don't really necessarily want to spend the time and the money to train these models ourselves. And as far as we know, this is, this is OK if we use these pre-trained models. So I guess, why not? Uh, it is true that if they were to turn off the spigot and people stopped, to, stopped releasing these things, then we would uh, have to deal with that. But um, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so the question was around if we've uh, tried to learn, I guess, where the mannequin is in the image uh, in order to kind of, let's say, classify our products into short sleeve, long sleeves, and things like that. So we actually record this data ourselves anyway. Um, it's kind of out of laziness or the power of deep learning that we could just shove images with the mannequin through and we get reasonable results out. So we do tend to find that like sleeve length tends to be like one of the aspects that the model learns for similarity. But I think like an exciting like avenue to go down would be because we have this expert knowledge that we know that this is a short sleeve top, you can imagine we, we use this algorithm to learn visually similar items and then we kind of rank them afterwards based on our expert knowledge. So we could use the other features that we have in there to then let's say either filter, so to just show short sleeve or we are keeping track of what everybody's clicking on, and we could actually run a learning to rank model uh, using that expert information afterwards. Uh, TBD. <laughs> Great. It's, it's like lunchtime, so I'll let you all go. Thank you.